Welcome everyone to this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon we'll be focusing on a recent book by University of Georgia historian Claudio Sant entitled Unworthy Republic, The Dispossession of Native Americans and the Road to Indian Territory, published by W.W. W. Norton in 2020. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my long-standing fellow co-chair from the Wilson Center, Christian Osterman. Today's event is a novel and special one in that we are joined at the helm, or I guess rather the keyboard and the camera, by Karen Wolf, professor of history at the College of William and Mary and the director of the Amohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, which is co-sponsoring and co-organizing today's event. The Omohundro Institute supports scholars and scholarship focused on the expansive field of early American history. It publishes the Distinguished William and Mary Quarterly. It sponsors fellowships and a range of scholarly events, which like this seminar currently take place in the online realm. And as for the Washington History Seminar, it is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, we've been meeting generally weekly in pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center since pandemic restrictions in this webinar format. We have some 24 sessions ahead of us uh, this season after today, including a session this coming Friday, January 29th at 4.30 on Joan Wallach Scott's new book on the judgment of history. And next Monday, February 1st at 4 p.m. on Sarah Miller Davenport's Gateway State Hawaii and the transformation, cultural transformation of American empire. Behind the scenes, there are two people who make this seminar possible, Pete Bierstecker of Wilson Center, Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And we thank our two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous donors. As always, we invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer session section of this webinar, we ask that those of you with questions use the raise hand function on Zoom um, or use the Q&A function. Those watching on Facebook Live uh, can email uh, questions uh, to the uh, uh, address uh, that will be uh, uh, on the side here. Um, we will call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I'm done. I turn the screen over to Karen Wolf, who will introduce today's speakers and who will moderate today's discussion. Karen, the Zoom room, all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. And I don't want to belabor the um, the opening remarks here, but I do want to say that on behalf of the Omohundro Institute, uh, we're really delighted to be partnering with the Washington History Seminar, with Wilson Center, obviously, and National History Center, to bring more early American history which is so important for so many reasons, among them the platform for our nation's history to this important audience. And I am just delighted to have brought this stellar group of early American scholars um, here today. So um, first we're going to hear from the scholar whose work we're focused on, and it is my great pleasure to introduce. I got this little thing from Eric watching the Washington History Seminar. He always holds up the book, so here I am holding out the book. It's our material artifact here, the book. Okay, so first we're going to hear from Claudio Sant, who is, in addition to being a wonderful person, also the Richard B. Russell Professor in American History and Distinguished Research Professor and Co-Director of the Center for Virtual History and Associate Director of the Institute of Native American Studies at the University of Georgia. Claudio is the author of West of the Revolution, an Uncommon History of 1776. He is the author of Black, White, and Indian, Race and the Unmaking of an American Family, and A New Order of Things, Property, Power, and the Transformation of the Creek Indian. His scholarship has been recognized by any number of grants and awards, including from the National Endowment of the Humanities, and he is the primary author of important digital projects, including the Invasion of America, a visual representation of the acquisition by the United States of over a billion acres of native lands. The invasion of America has been profiled in Slate, in Vox, the New York Times, and in many other media outlets for its powerful lessons. His most recent book, our topic today, is Unworthy Republic, The Dispossession of Native Americans and the Road to Indian Territory, published by Norton in 2020. 
Unworthy Republic was a finalist for the National Book Award, shortlisted for the Kundal Prize in Historical Literature, and selected by Publishers Weekly as one of the 10 best books of the year. We're going to hear from Claudio first, and then we will turn to our respondents. Claudio. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I want to thank the National History Center, the Woodrow Wilson Center, and the Omohundro Institute for sponsoring this event. And, and special thanks to Karen Wolf uh, for the invitation and to Kathleen Duvall and Michael Whitkin for joining me here today. I'm especially appreciative because I know at the start of the semester we have all kinds of obligations and I, I really appreciate their making the time to, to join me here today. So last year in, in McGirt versus Oklahoma, Justice Gorsuch wrote that on the far end of the Trail of Tears was a promise. Today, I wanna to talk about the near end of that trail, not Oklahoma, but Washington DC and the native peoples who 200 years ago lived east of the Mississippi River. In the South, there were about 60,000 Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Seminoles who owned about 68,000 square miles of land. So that's roughly half of Mississippi, a third of Alabama, the north quarter of Georgia, and a large chunk of central Florida. These were some of the most valuable agricultural lands in the entire world at the time, and they were ideal for growing cotton. In the north, there were about 20,000 native peoples, including Senecas, Ottawas, Shawnees, and Potawatomis, and they owned about 60,000 square miles of land. But from the perspective of US citizens, this land was far less valuable than that in the south. Most of it lay in northern Michigan and Wisconsin. And in fact, the most desirable of these lands amounted to some 500 square miles in present-day Ohio. And these lands were essential for canal building projects that speculators were interested in funding. In the 1820s, US politicians began talking about expelling these people in a single stroke, extinguishing their land claims and moving them to the outermost edge of the nation. Like any political act, the proponents had varied and not always consistent interests. There were missionaries who styled themselves as friends of the Indian, and they sincerely believed that expulsion was the best thing for native peoples. Indians were disappearing before the onslaught of settlers, they said. There was no holding back the expanding US population, they insisted. And therefore, the only way to save indigenous Americans was to send them west, even if against their will. And in the west, they would be civilized, to use the language of the day, and they would learn to survive in the United States. But many other advocates of the policy were cynical. And in fact, I think these are the more important, more influential players in this policy. They used the purported humanitarian benefits as a cover for their avarice. And they, in fact, wanted to seize the land to extend slavery across the South. They dreamed of extending their empire of slave labor camps across the South, eventually to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. They thought of seizing Mexico too, of ruling over the continent, and even of crossing the Gulf to seize Cuba, the most valuable slave colony in the world. In February of 1830, the desire to expel indigenous Americans gave rise to a bill that was informally called the Bill to Remove Indians. And you can read a draft copy of this, of the House version at least, in the records of the US House of Representatives. And not surprisingly, it's full of all kinds of legal rationalizing. The most revealing moment occurs when the Committee on Indian Affairs justified, in its words, the superior right of agriculturalists over the claims of sovereign tribes. Well, this was an inadvertent slip. They didn't mean to say sovereign. And someone um, went over the manuscript, crossed out sovereign, and replaced it with savage. According to contemporary observers, this was the single most controversial piece of legislation to come before the nation up to that point. And it generated a massive petition campaign to Congress. 
But in May of 1830, Andrew Jackson signed what we commonly call the Indian Removal Act into law, authorizing the president to exchange federal lands in the West for Indian homelands in the East and to deport some 80,000 people. With the passage of the act, the federal government began a two-step process. The first step was to dispossess Indian residents of their homelands, and that involved settling treaties with the people to be deported. After one round of failed negotiations in August of 1830, President Jackson exposed the sentiments of many in his administration. He said, I have used all of the persuasive means in my power I have exonerated the national character from all imputation and now leave the poor deluded Creeks and Cherokees to their fate and their annihilation. Land speculators assisted the federal government by using every stratagem they could devise to separate farmers from their lands. They drew up funny contracts, they, play, they paid native farmers in worthless paper money, and they chased them off with guns and clubs. And when that failed, the federal government sent in troops leading to a brief but violent war in the Creek Nation in 1836 and to a protracted seven-year war in Florida. So that was the first step in this process. The second step was deportation, the actual transport of these people to the west, sometimes 100 miles, sometimes uh, close to 1,000 miles to the west. It was a debacle from start to finish. Provisioners did not deliver promised supplies. Elderly deportees and young children had to walk shoeless and lightly clothed through freezing rain. Cholera infected the filthy and overcrowded steamboats that had been hired by the federal government and at every turn, the commissary general of subsistence who oversaw this operation sought to save money. So the explanation for this disorder has at least two parts. One of them is that the federal government was simply overmatched. This young, ambitious and arrogant nation did not have the capability of transporting, feeding and clothing thousands of families. The federal government, hard as it is to believe from our perspective today, employed fewer than 11,000 people. And the vast majority of them, approximately 8,000 delivered the mail. They would be of no use in deporting families. Only some 600 worked in Washington. It's worth considering also that there were no roads to Indian territory. Rivers had to be charted, bridges had to be built, causeways had to be constructed. In short, there was no Google map to be consulted. The second reason this was such a debacle, and, and this is the more important reason in my view, is that the operation was shot through with a disregard and scorn for the people being transported. It didn't really matter to most US citizens what happened to the deportees? From their perspective, indigenous peoples were going far away. Few people asked questions. And as for the administrators, the government clerks, tireless clerks working in the War Department, they were largely unmoved by the human experiment they were presiding over. The paperwork was seemingly endless, but they impassively kept things moving, responding to queries from the field, filing letters, keeping accounts up to date. They took satisfaction in ensuring that all correspondence was received and filed with a tripartite fold. They ordered that all letters should be addressed and titled uniformly, and they verified that accounts were accurate to the fraction of a penny. But through all of this, they never commented on the human costs to this vast experiment that they were overseeing. So we can discuss some of these subjects in more detail during the Q&A, but I wanna wrap up this introduction with three takeaways. The first is that there was nothing inevitable about the deportation of indigenous Americans in the 1830s. It's, it's true, as we all know, that Europeans began dispossessing native peoples nearly from the first moment they set foot on the continent. But by the 1830s, the remaining native nations had been living next door to white and black Americans for several generations. 
They recognized the unjust situation they faced. They knew firsthand how avaricious white citizens could be. And they understood the risks and dangers of staying in their homelands. And yet, most of them fought to remain in place. They sent delegates to Washington, they lobbied, they bargained, they launched speaking tours up and down the East Coast to generate support for their cause. And the act itself passed by a mere five votes out of 199 that were cast in the House. It swung on a handful of representatives and only after President Jackson twisted arms and threatened careers. So that's the first takeaway. The second is that this policy was a turning point. It was a turning point for indigenous peoples and for the United States. Native Americans said so, they were leaving their homelands. So too did white Americans. Residents in upstate New York wrote of the indelible disgrace of our Republic, should indigenous peoples be expelled. Another group from Ohio insisted that Congress's actions would determine, quote, whether the future historian of our country shall applaud their measures or brand the character of this young and boasting Republic with infamy and disgrace. But the policy was not just a moral failure. Expulsion transformed the geographical relationship between the continent's longtime residents and its newcomers. The geographical segregation created a westward moving frontier. And as the United States expanded toward the Pacific over the course of the 19th century, the army maintained that frontier by killing native people or concentrating them on marginal lands. So the infamous Plains Wars of the second half of the 19th century culminated in the massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890. But when the 7th Cavalry shot and killed over 150 women, children, and men and buried them in a mass grave in South Dakota, they put the final period on a policy that had been established in the 1830s. So that's the second point I want to leave you with. The third is that although US citizens claimed that Indians were different from other people, and although they insisted that the United States was exceptional, among the world's nations. With this policy to expel indigenous Americans, the United States joined a long list of nations that administered mass deportations. And in fact, the deportation of native peoples was among the first in the modern era. It became something of a model for colonial empires around the world. The massive US undertaking was a recent example of what an ambitious state could accomplish with modern administrative tools. So Tocqueville, who published his famous account of democracy in America in the 1830s, witnessed what he called the solemn spectacle of a party of Choctaw families crossing the icy Mississippi River at the outset of the decade. And he was truly ambivalent about the policy. Nonetheless, he deemed the energy and determination of US expansion to be a model for French Algeria. So within five years of the French occupation of Algeria in 1830, colonists were referring, French colonists were referring to the locals as indigen, indigenous people. And this was a term that had formerly been reserved for people in the new world. America was talked about incessantly, French administrators observed. The US sponsored expulsion also occupied the minds of Russian officers in the Caucasus in the 1840s. These Circassians are just like your American Indians, the regional governor reportedly told one American visitor shortly before Russia deported a half million people. And toward the end of the century, German imperialists in Southwest Africa looked to the United States for an example of how to expel local residents in the name of progress. This was a goal that was widely shared by European administrators who coveted the African continent's vast resources. And surely most notoriously during the Nazi conquest of Eastern Europe, Hitler equated indigenous inhabitants, his term for Eastern Europeans, he equated them with Indians. And he declared in his words that the Volga must be our Mississippi. 
So it was in this context of dispossession and deportation that the federal government promised native peoples that they could retain their lands in the West for as long as the grass grows and the waters run. This is the promise that Justice Gorsuch referenced in his decision. But the promise proved to be as just as dishonest as the act that gave rise to it. And native peoples were skeptical from the outset. In the 1830s, their homelands in the East were secured to them by treaty. And Creek leaders asked at the time, was there some other form of contract, something more powerful than a treaty that would somehow give them an unbreakable title to their new territory in the West? If so, they did not know what it was and they were proven right. So I'll stop there and we can pick up some of these themes and subjects in our discussion. Thank you so much, Claudio. Um, it's so important for, I think, um, people to frame American history as Native American history, as I think Kathleen and others um, have written in a book with that title. There is no American history without Native American history and certainly early American history is foundationally Native American history. It is Native American history first. I know we're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, our first respondent um, is Kathleen Duvall, who is the Bowman and Gordon Gray Distinguished Term Professor at the University of California, also a wonderful person. Now I have to say that for everyone, but it is true, <laughs> it is true. <laughs> Kathleen's research focuses on early America, particularly cross-cultural relations on North American borderlands and the means by which various, Native, uh, various American Indian, European and African descended men and women interacted from the 16th through the early 19th centuries. She's the author of award-winning scholarship, including The Native Ground, Indians and Colonists in the Heart of the Continent. And she is co-editor with John Duval of Interpreting a Continent, Voices from Colonial America. Her most recent book is Independence Lost, Lives on the Edge of the American Revolution. Professor Duval. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start by talking about uh, what kind of book this is, because I think it's really an exemplar of its genre. Um, Norton is a big publisher of this kind of book. It's a book written by a respected academic historian that synthesizes current scholarship. And by synthesizes, I do not mean sums up. I mean, gives a new and coherent understanding to a really vibrant conversation that's been, go been going on over the past decade or so in monographs and articles um, and brings that to a new level to give new answers to some of these questions that have been um, discussed in more academic uh, genre, uh, places. Um, and this kind of book then packages that for relatively more general readers who know that the topic, in this case, Indian removal, is important um, and know some things about it, right? Um, but probably haven't read this cutting edge scholarship that's going on in academic places. Um, so in no way is it supposed to be the final say on a topic, if there even ever could be such a thing. But ideally what it is, and I think this book will be, um, is a, a, an inspiration to the next round of academic scholarship that brings new questions and new answers to an important topic. So I'll spend most of my time talking about what I think are those big synthesizing contributions of Unworthy Republic. To me, Claudio's biggest contribution here is showing that my early 19th century Indian removal was both, you know, you got a sense of this as he spoke, both unlike what had come before, unprecedented, a turning point, and yet entirely embedded in history. In so doing, he corrects two big assumptions that are made in both the older historiography and in popular perceptions of Indian removal. Um, one, that it was isolated, that it's this kind of anomaly of American history that comes out of nowhere. Um, and two, the sort of opposite of that, that it's inevitable, that in 1492, with the arrival of the first Europeans, Indian removal will happen and will take this form. Instead, Unworthy Republic shows how an idea, just one possibility out of countless ways that relations on the North American continent could have gone, how that became a, a gruesome and unjust reality that stands out as one of the nation's greatest sins and that shaped 
injustices in the 20th century and today. Claudio manages this kind of tricky balance of, of showing mass deportation of Native people as not an isolated aberration, but also as not inevitable. Um, he does this in part, he sets this up early with his rich descriptions in early chapters of how Native nations and towns did live side by side with the United States on the U.S. northwestern border and the U.S. southwestern border. Different kinds of peoples on the continent had always traded and allied and married. Um, and that didn't stop with the coming of Europeans or with the founding of the United States. Claudio, in one of my favorite of many amazing quotations in this book, quotes a US Indian agent admitting Choctaws were pretty good neighbors. In truth, Claudio himself writes, only one thing was truly irreconcilable, native and white ownership of the same land. In the Southeast, especially white Americans wanted native land to turn into plantations. And by the 1830s, they had the military might to make it so. The South is the primary focus of unworthy Republic. The native homelands that became the plantations of Georgia and Alabama, and Tennessee and Mississippi, parts of Florida, parts of the Carolinas, that focus comes out of Claudio's past work, uh, most of which is on Southeastern and Native peoples. But I think that a particular focus on the Cherokees, the Cherokees particularly in a book about Indian removal is, is unavoidable, it kind of has to be that way. Not because the Cherokees are the most important in this history, but because the Cherokees are the history that readers are most likely to know. Um, likely to know the Cherokee victory in the US Supreme Court that then President Jackson ignored, um, and of course their terrible journey west that became known as the Trail of Tears. And so for readers, and I think those of us who teach Indian removal can do the same thing, can copy Claudio here. Um, Claudio uses the familiar story of the Cherokees to pull in other parts of this history that sometimes get drowned out by that story. So let me mention a few of those. Um, the book so clearly shows that the horror of the Trail of Tears is just one piece of the extreme violence that preceded and accompanied and outlasted removal. As Claudio puts it, across the South in the second half of the 1830s, US soldiers, state militia, and white vigilantes felt justified in killing Indigenous Americans. Death didn't just happen on the trail. Another component that he highlights that can get drowned out by Cherokee removal um, is that of deportations beyond the Southeast. Claudio covers in brief many of these Senecas and Delawares, Shawnees, Ottawas, and on and on and on. If you've never seen the map of Indian territory after removal, or you know, frankly, a map of reservation lands in Oklahoma today, it is worth taking a moment to do that and just look at the peoples who got Put side by side, remember your American history. What are the Senecas doing next to the Quapaws? Um, it, it really brings home this, this smooshing together of people in this new place for most of them. Um, there are other books that go deeper into other dispossessions and deportations in this era. And, and later I'll put some of these into the chat if people are interested, um, including John Bowes, 2016, Land Too Good for Indians, Northern Indian Removal. Um, Claudio's book will pair well, uh, pairs well with that. It will pair well with my co-panelist, Michael Wiggins, forthcoming book from UNC Press, um, and other forthcoming work that, uh, that historians Elena Roberts and Nakia Parker are doing on Chickasaw and Choctaw slaveholding. Um, another thing that can get drowned out by Cherokee removal, and this one gets, gets less attention in this book for, for good reason, I think, um, are peoples who lived through these same pressures in this same era and managed to stay on portions of their homelands. Um, the history of people who stayed is crucial for understanding this era and everything that's come since. And, and for that readers, I would suggest readers go to also to Michael's forthcoming book. Um, my colleague, Melinda Maynard Lowry on the Lumbees is a great example of that. Gene O'Brien on native New England. And if I could pitch forthcoming work by a couple of my students, uh, Brooke Bauer on the Catawbas and Elizabeth Ellis on petite nations in the lower Mississippi Valley. Uh, to return to the point about what we get from Claudio's focus on the Southeast and the Cherokees particularly, one of the things that lets him highlight is, is Cherokee language. Um, 
if you look at the Cherokee Phoenix, which is the newspaper that the Cherokee Nation began publishing in this era, um, if you don't read Cherokee, and nobody's told you, you would think that the Cherokee columns and the English columns are translation. It's, it's a dual language publication, and you would think those might just be translations of each other. Um, but as, as Claudio tells us, they are absolutely not. Um, so to just give one quick example, he has several. Um, one of these columns in the, the English language version in the Cherokee Phoenix praised the civilized life, right, with that kind of uh, loaded word of civilization. The Cherokee language one uh, instead praised in Cherokee what might better be translated as learning, um, knowledge of the written word, a little more neutral. Language is one of the areas that I see next rounds of scholarship really taking to an even deeper level of analysis as more historians learn native languages and work with native linguists. Um, if you want more, more in the Phoenix, particularly Constant Owl, who did her MA at uh, Western Carolina University, really digs into the Cherokee within this newspaper. Another way that Unworthy Republic shows Indian removal as both unique and embedded in history is in its many comparisons to the contemporaneous enslavement of people of African descent. Claudio digs into the financing of and profits from the intertwined evils of native dispossession and plantation slavery. And he points out uh, models for deportation in the Atlantic slave trade um, and also in the domestic slave trade that was, uh, that was after the ending of the Atlantic slave trade, forcibly moved uh, enslaved people from state to state within the United States. And one of the discussions I found most enlightening in the book is how it conveys real debates within the US population about Indian removal. Um, these, are, these debates are happening at the same time that the abolition movement is on the rise and plantation slavery is on the rise. At exactly the same time people are debating Indian removal. Um, some northern newspapers accused Georgia of sedition. Native activists persuaded some missionaries to oppose removal in the same ways that white abolitionists' beliefs were shaped by Black abolitionists. As the new intellectual historians have shown, Native and Black thinkers have always spoken out in debates that white people were having about them. U.S. Superintendent of Indian Affairs Thomas McKinney assisted the passage of the Indian Removal Act, but then came to question its implementation and a result, as a result found himself unceremoniously dismissed by President Jackson. As Claudio puts it, those who expressed doubts about the expulsion of Native families did not, not last long in the Jackson administration. I suspect countless Trump appointees uh, might be able to relate. <laughs> like McKinney, some of them have expressed a sort of feeble and too late regrets. Uh, as McKinney put it, I knew all was wrong, deeply so. I have tended not to take laments like that very seriously, uh, whether in our present day or in the era of Indian removal. But Unworthy Republic reminds us that dissenting voices within a group, however feeble, however in the minority they might be, are vitally important in exposing moral responsibility in their own time and in the kinds of histories we get to write about these times and peoples later your own people in your own era told you that what you were doing was wrong. To me, the greatest achievement, and I'll wrap up here, of Unworthy Republic is its voices. Um, not only Thomas McKinney and Cherokee Chief John Ross, um, but the countless soldiers and agents whose voices and silences bear witness to ex attempted extermination, all given to us in Claudio Sant's clear and powerful voice. And I had, should I say questions now or is that later? So um, I think I'm gonna give Claudio a chance to kind of um, chat back with you a little bit and give you guys a few minutes to go back and forth before we bring Michael Wicken into the conversation. Okay, good, okay. Great. Well, if I were gonna ask one question, it would be about, um, uh, about nation. Uh, so um, the afterward, your afterward Claudio quotes Frederick Douglass and he says, if, if he's talking about black Americans, if we had set up a separate nationality gone off on the outer borders of your civilization. We should have been pushed off precisely as the Indians have been pushed off. Um, and the year afterward does talk about native nations, um, but in general, you, you put more emphasis, I think, on native land than on native nationhood. Um, 
And I wondered if, so some recent scholarship, Julie Reed talks about the survival of the Cherokee Nation and how important that was as it moved to Indian Territory. Um, some native polities have changed their official names to nation in, in recent years. Um, and of course, the McGirt decision that you mentioned um, is about sovereignty. So I wondered, uh, I found myself wondering, so what, what would it happen if we sort of fit nationhood and sovereignty into this history? Um, are native nation, are native peoples expelled in part because they're nations? Um, and what does their survival as nations tell us? Uh, thank you for all of those thoughts and, and comments and insights in, into this into this really rich subject. Um, um, a, a lot to talk about, um, but let me just um, choose a couple of things here. Your, this, this question of nationhood, um, you mentioned the Frederick Douglass quote that appears in the book, and, and he said, you know, it's, um, the reason that um, white Americans could not exterminate black Americans is that they were too close to them. I mean, and, and he means that in, in many different senses, but, but, part of it, but part of it is, is simply the geographical relationship between the two peoples. And, and that's why I think this moment really truly is transformative because although it's obviously the case that white Americans had been dispossessing indigenous Americans for hundreds of years by 1830, this is this moment for the young Republic um, People are, this is one or two generations after the American Revolution. Um, so people's grandparents had been part of that great cause. And they're looking at the 1830s and, and there, there, there's still some sense, I think, among a lot of US citizens that the United States could somehow be different from what they call the, the corrupt despotic governments of Europe. So was it going to live up to the values that were expressed in the American Revolution? And they saw this as this great betrayal um, of the Republic. Um, but the, the geographic relationship after this act is passed, from the perspective of US citizens, Native Americans only exist on the outside of the Republic, on the fur farthest, furthest Western edge that then advances west to the eventually to the Pacific Ocean. So they're the way they imagine the Republic changes in the 1830s. That is true for native peoples too, right? I mean, their political relationship to the United States changes and the way they engage has to change. And so, you know, yes, from the 21st century, indigenous politics are different now than they were in the 1830s. From the, from the 21st century, I think the language is a little bit different, the perspective is different, but that's, that's the result of nearly 200 years of history that has passed since 1830. In 1830, um, Native peoples are negotiating, they're lobbying, and one thing I, that really astonished me is that it appears that half the Choctaw Nation wished to stay in Mississippi. They actually were um, willing to give up their sovereignty if they could stay in their homelands. Um, in the end of the day, they were dispossessed anyhow. Um, but that's, that's, that's quite astonishing. Um, I think they imagined that they could retain their communities. They could stay in their homelands. Um, and you know, that, that that would be preferable to going off um, to this unknown region in, in the West. Um, you, you mentioned, um, I'll just touch on one more of, of, the, of the subjects that you brought up, but you mentioned this link between slavery and, and Indian removal. And, and this is really, um, you, you can't overemphasize just how significant this is because, because it, it frees up when, when Native peoples are moved out of the South, it frees up um, some of the most fertile land, the most valuable land in the entire world at the time, uh, the so-called Black Belt, named for the color of the soil. It's ideal for growing cotton. And so, you know, when we think of the history of the antebellum South, and when we think of the Confederacy in the 1860s, we think of Alabama and Mississippi 
Um, those lands, only 30 years before the outbreak of the Civil War, those lands were largely Indian country. So it really just completely transforms the South and really changes the nation too, and shapes the lives of, of tens of thousands of enslaved African Americans. Thank you both so much. I want to bring in uh, to this conversation for an additional response, and then perhaps we we'll all come together here at the wonderful Michael Whitkin. Uh, Michael is professor of history and American culture at the University of Michigan and a past director twice of the university's program in Native American studies. Michael is a member of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. His work explores the juxtaposition of native and European experiences and responses to the process of mutual discovery that created the new world in North America with a particular focus on the Great Lakes and the Great Plains. His current research examines the intersection of race, national identity, and state making in the old Northwest of the early Republic. And his prize winning scholarship includes his books, An Infinity of Nations, How the Native New World Shaped Early North America, and the forthcoming Seeing Red, Indigenous land, Black lives, and the political economy of plunder in North America. Michael. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and, and to have this conversation. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, you know, th this extraordinary book on Willie Republic is, is um, really resonating because I've just completed a project myself that's looking at this and looking at uh, these questions. And I think one of the things that, that Claudio does that um, really resonated with me it is both the idea that his first big takeaway that this nothing is inevitable that removal wasn't inevitable um and paired with that is the way that he's able to show readers how very much what to do with native native peoples and what to do in terms of the issue of removal is a national conversation uh it's a national conversation playing out in congress but it's also a national conversation playing out on the local level, as he's able to show you, um, as, as people wrestle with what to do with their Choctaw and Cherokee neighbors, their Creek neighbors. Uh, and it's very much a conversation that that outcome is inevitable. The removal of Native peoples, um, in some ways, is inevitable. Although, one of the things that, that I want to hear Claudio talk about is, for me, it seems like one of the things that, that seems to be an inevitable part of the discourse that Americans are thinking about, barring from uh, Michel Trio, you know, unthinkable history. I don't think Americans could imagine uh, an indigenous homeland as being something that had a right to exist on, uh, alongside the United States. And so one of the big questions people are wrestling with uh, that Clyde captures is what do we do with these native populations that are within uh, sovereign states? And I think some part of that um, has to do with the, the, the value of the black belt um, in that relationship um, to the sort of political economy of the United States. You know, Tocqueville, uh, as Claudio mentioned, is traveling through the US at this time period. And in addition to seeing the Choctaw on the Mississippi, he makes his way up to Saginaw, Michigan. He makes his, makes his way to Detroit. Uh, and he says he wants to go to Detroit because he wants to go to the West where the Indians are and see them before they vanish. And then he kind of goes overland on a trip to Saginaw. And when he arrives at Saginaw, he's about to take a canoe across the river. And the canoeman who's a native person says to him in French, be careful, you don't want to fall in. And he writes in his in his uh, two weeks in the desert, that he would have been less astounded if his, his horse had spoken to him in French. And so he asked this person, how is it you come to speak French? And he says, my father, I'm a, you know, basically says, I'm, my father is French, my mother is, uh, is Ojibwe. And he's astonished. And he's partly astonished because he not only imagines Native peoples as disappearing, but that they're sort of unchanging. And here is this example of Native people who have learned to live with outsiders for centuries for, uh, and have incorporated them into their own communities. Um, so Native people are very much part of communities where uh, uh, settlers embed themselves. And this is the conversation that we're having. One of the things I'm curious about uh, for Claudio, I think for me, it seems as if one of the things you're able to demonstrate is that the, the, the value um, uh, of the Black Belt was simply too much to leave it in Indian hands. And also the way that you create value and wealth in the South is through expanding your, your slave property. And so these two things become linked, expelling Indians, increasing your slave property. Um, and it, it's really phenomenal because the, the spaces that Claudio mentioned, uh, like Ohio, also uh, have a lot of removal, but places like Michigan do not. In fact, in 1836, uh, the federal government conducts a big treaty with the uh, Anishinaabe peoples in Michigan, and they they ask them to accept removal. And the people, uh, uh, the Odawa who signed the treaty, say, "No, we're good. We're going to stay." Uh, 
Um, and they negotiate a provision where they can stay on their homelands. And they also negotiate a provision where they can continue to hunt and fish on any uh, land where they've extinguished title, but it hasn't been settled by private property and turned into private property. And one of the reasons this happens is because those, annuity, the, those Indians who remain behind in Michigan um, uh, receive annuities, that's cash payments on an annual basis in compensation for the money that they've, uh, or the land that they just ceded. And most of that, uh, any given annuity, up to 90, 95% of it is claimed uh, by fur traders and other colonial officials uh, as recovery of debt from the fur trade. And so leaving Indians in place becomes a source of ongoing money uh, in, in the North in a way that doesn't sort of happen in the Southeast where it seems the value of um, Indian land just surpasses any value that you could get from having this kind of ongoing financial relationship. And one of the questions I have for Claudio um, is, is thinking through this, uh, another question here back to the inevitability uh, is that native peoples are not only embedded or, or, or in this larger settler world that they're living in, but they're also often intermarried. So lots of mixed race people um, in say Michigan, Wisconsin territories, when they do these big treaties, uh, they get annuity that's given to them. Their, their indigeneity is recognized. They get a portion of the treaty. They're not given reservations. Uh, they're explicitly told you can't have a land reservation, but we'll give you compensation uh, for that. And so these people also become sort of implicated in the, the process of extinguishing title of their indigenous relatives because they're making money off it themselves. Um, now, it's interesting to me that th they position themselves by claiming to be half-breed citizens of the United States uh, and the Oju half-breed Ojibwe citizens. And so I'm, I'd like to hear Claudio talk about the role of mixed race people like, like uh, uh, the Ross family who end up being you know, super implicated in the decision to, to relocate West. But it's interesting to me, I'd like to hear you talk about how mixed race people in uh, the South uh, end up being uh, adjudicated treaties along with their indigenous relatives. They're not separated out. And does that have an impact both in terms of their ability to not negotiate a, a chance to stay? In other words, they can't claim citizenship because they are uh, citizens of an indigenous nation. And uh, how come they don't get separate? Um, how come they don't get treated with separately? How come they're not separated out? I'm super curious to hear how that works out because it seems to me like um, you, as you get into um, uh, the Rosses and their role inevitably in signing uh, treaties that lead to Cherokee removal, um, they do. You do have a couple of points where you're pointing out that, that um, they're being distinguished from being mixed race. Um, but the other thing I think, linking back to that question, wanting to hear Claudia talk more about that is, I think the other thing that he really shows you is that what you see here, not only is it not inevitable, um, but one of the things that the, the Unworthy Republic shows you is a world being remade, that this particular moment removal, this gets to Claudia's other said big, uh, big point, which this is a turning point in history. And I think um, one of the things the book shows brilliantly is that this is a book, this is a moment uh, where the world is being remade. And I think, um, he has a point on, on page uh, 246 where he says, the world created by the expulsion of native peoples seemed to be on the verge of exploding in an apocalypse of violence. And it, it's a kind of, that, that chapter is this moment in, in 1836 um, and it captures the, the, this moment of a world in flux and being remade. You've got uh, Creek Indians trying to get to Florida to fight with the Seminoles. You've got the Choctaw who said uh, they would stay behind and accept their fate as citizens of a nation catching the Americans off guard because they didn't expect them to want to do that. They thought they would want to um, make the gamble the, the John Ross and the Cherokees did that in order to preserve their nation, they would accept removal or at least some portion of those Cherokee accepted that. So uh, I, I thought that was a fascinating point and, and I'd like to hear more about that. We do have um, a difference in the sense too that in Wisconsin and Michigan, there just isn't the pressure uh, for that land. Uh, in 1837, when they make the St. Peter's Treaty, if you're living in northern Wisconsin, you're not really going to be farming. Uh, you maybe would maybe be involved in timber and timber extraction, but it doesn't necessarily require you to sort of um, dispossess Indians, at least fully, especially when you count on the fact that by leaving them in place, you get annuities that you can then keep claiming uh, huge portions of. So it's interesting in the sense that, that um, they made the decision within the states and the federal government in places like Michigan, and Wisconsin, to allow native peoples to remain behind. And that's a really specific kind of decision. Whereas I think the world that's being created that Claudia shows you here in the Southeast, they consciously make the decision not to. That when they give a provision for people to stay behind with the Choctaw uh, and the Choctaw take them up on that, they then uh, commit acts of violence to remove them because they say uh, on the ground in, in Mississippi, we don't really want you to take advantage of this provision. Um, so I, I'd like to hear 
Uh, Claudia will talk about how much uh, some of these different factors, mixed race uh, members of these communities, what role do they have in either um, trying to block the removal or facilitating the removal? Does the mixed race status um, allow them to claim citizenship in the US? Um, I wasn't really clear um, in, entirely if that's the case, um, if the, or if they even assert that kind of, um, that kind of role. Because they are doing this in places like Michigan and Wisconsin, but they don't seem to me from your book to be doing, making that claim. They're said, it seemed to be kind of staking their claim to citizenship and belonging within their indigenous nation. And, and that leads to their removal. Um, so with that, I, I will um, stop speaking and let Claudio respond and maybe we can have a larger discussion. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, again, thank you for those thoughts and comments and um, so much to think and talk about. So I, again, I'll just try to um, take a couple of the issues that you raised and address them. Um, this question of, of mixed peoples, um, one of the things, and, and you, you got at that this in your comments, it, it, one of the things that's striking really is just the, the diversity of Native peoples in, in 1830. And, um, and there are people who whose first language is their indigenous language. There are other folks who are native whose first language is English. Um, John Ross is one of them. And in fact, he has a better command of English than his antagonist, Andrew Jackson. Um, so, and, and you find people who are subsistence farmers. There are folks in the North, as you know, who are, who are trappers and, and hunters. Um, there are, Native peoples who own cotton plantations and own slaves. So there's this tremendous diversity. So um, that diversity gets flattened in the national debate about the deportation of indigenous Americans. Because by the 1830s, the vast majority of, of US citizens live between, um, really between Philadelphia and Boston. and and most of them hadn't really seen a native person. So, um, you know, they had a lot of stereotypes and they were fed stereotypes. There was really a very cynical um, PR campaign launched by the Jackson administration to tell them, to tell white Americans that native peoples were basically savages, that they didn't know how to farm and um, they weren't Christian. Some of them weren't, but some of them were, uh, that they were all drunkards and so on and so on. Um, the flip side, as you say, is that you have these people, native peoples who are well versed in US politics. They're familiar with Washington. If, if you go to, if you visit Washington in 1830, you are going to see inevitably um, delegations from indigenous nations um, as visitors commented and they had, you know, each delegation had its favorite place to have coffee in the afternoon, one of them noted. So, you know, they're familiar with, uh, with um, the halls of Congress. They know English. They know the way politics work in the United States. They, they're familiar with the economy. Um, some of them are intermarried, as you say, um, and, and they're deeply embedded in, in many ways with the United States, with their neighbors. Um, so their role, they play this essential role, I think, in helping Native peoples push back. Um, John Ross, the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, at one point, one of his um, fellow citizens says in a letter that John Ross is, is waging intellectual warfare. Right? He's not picking up a tomahawk as a stereotypical savage is supposed to do. Instead, he's filing lawsuits that go to the Supreme Court. So. Um, it's, it comes to the surprise of many US citizens um, that there are native peoples who are, who are this savvy. There are some, however, as, as you suggest, who take advantage of their position. Um, there's a Choctaw named Greenwood LaFleur who's um, despised by a lot of his fellow citizens, Choctaw citizens. Um, he's a slave owner. He gets involved with the Union Bank of Mississippi, which is just a corrupt banking financial institution that finally collapses in Mississippi. He builds a giant um, a plantation. And, and at the end of the day, he actually stays in Mississippi. So it was entirely possible for people like that 
who had the resources to stay behind. They, they were small in number, but there was also a small community of Creek peoples who were able to, to stay behind in Alabama. Um, you raised this question of um, inevitability. Um, so this has two parts to it. There's the economic question. And yes, the, the economic, the forces that, you know, the amount of money that is, that is involved and at stake is, is just tremendous. So one of the things that surprised me in digging into the story is that, um, that bankers in Wall Street in Boston were funneling millions of dollars down into the South to speculate in Indian lands. Because we normally think of this mostly as a Southern story, um, but Wall Street bankers were deeply involved and you can follow those financial circuits across the Atlantic Ocean. There were um, financiers in London who were also involved in speculating in land. So there really is a um, tremendous amount of money involved. Um, but, but there's a lot of money in capital involved, invested in slavery too. And, and, and that had a different ending in, a, in the 1860s, as, as we know. Um, so there's the, the economic pressure. Then there's the political question, right? Can white Americans imagine having sovereign or semi-sovereign nations within the boundaries of the United States? Um, there were Southern politicians who gave um, high-minded speeches on the floor of the House and Senate who said, you know, it's, an, uh, it's a contradiction. It's an it's a, it's a logical impossibility to, to have an imperium in imperio, as they said, using the Latin phrase, basically to have a, a sovereign entity within a larger sovereign entity, a nation. It was an impossibility. So we couldn't recognize, therefore, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw sovereignty. Um, but, you know, but that was just a, a kind of sorry rationalization because a lot of other U.S. citizens said that's absurd. That's what the United States is. It's, it's a federal republic with states that are sovereign entities. So, of course, we can have the, the Cherokee Nation within the boundaries of the United States. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and um, maybe we can pick up some of these themes later in the discussion. Great, thank you all so much. Um, I wanna just note as we bring this kind of together and have all of you in conversation together that there's some interesting themes in the questions and I think also in your comments, one of those themes just stepping way back is just how this work fits into kind of traditional arcs of American history, how people under have written American history really without this story or with a very different um, uh, kind of view on this story. That's still pretty prominent, actually, even in these in the questions here. A second is just um, it, something Michael raised explicitly, which is the way that native dispossession and, um, and slavery are absolutely twinned phenomena. Um, and that those are histories that we do not, that is, um, in the scholarship, we see this um, and we have seen this, you have written about this, Michael has written about this, you know, um, but that that twinning is not part of kind of traditional um, uh, American historical narrative. Um, and then the third thing is, um, and I'm wondering if you all could start with this question, because it pops up a couple of times in the, in the questions, and I know it's important to you, Claudio, because you talk about it in the very beginning of the book, which is your point that words matter that Indian removal is a kind of inadequate way of describing this phenomena, but rather you use words deportation, extermination, and genocide. Um, and there are other scholars who have used those words. And I want you to talk about, and maybe Kathleen and Michael can talk about this as well. What is the significance of using those words? Like why, why are those the words that you want to call upon? Um, what does it mean for us? What does it gain? Um, what are the consequences? Um, yeah, so I'll just, I, in, in the book, I don't call it Indian removal. Um, that was a term that was coined by proponents of the policy in the 1820s. And, and the opponents recognized immediately, as one of them said, that this was a, a soft 
term. It doesn't capture the violence and the coercion that lay behind it. Uh, and incidentally, we have a similar euphemism today because the federal government has a policy of, of what it calls expedited removal. Um, and that is when federal officers arrest um, undocumented immigrants and, and rather than give them a hearing for a judge, um, they take them across the border, uh, another euphemism. So, so I don't use that term Indian removal. Um, I use the term expulsion, which is historically accurate because opponents of the policy called it an expulsion at the time. I also call it at times a deportation. There were some foreign observers who used that term in the 1830s. Um, I like it because it gets at the kind of state apparatus, the bureaucracy that is built up around this process of, of shipping people to the West. And then the third term I use is extermination, also historically accurate. There were um, military, high-ranking military officers who wrote back and forth to each other and said that the Secretary of War goes for extermination, at least in the case of, of the Seminoles. Kathleen and Michael, I wonder if you wanted to weigh in on these um, word choices. These are ones that are not, it, Claudio's um, uh, kind of thinking about this is not utterly unique to him. Um, Jeff Osler and other scholars have been weighing the use of these terms. Yeah, I, I think it is super important. And I think um, I, I was taken by the mass deportation that resonated with me in terms of that terminology. And I think it's important because one of the things that happens like with the child separation at the border are so many people who uh, come out with cries of, you know, this is not who we are. And in fact, it, it, it's been deeply part of American history. Um, you know, Susan Sleeper's book on Ohio country reveals that, that the American campaign in the Ohio, George Washington asked uh, General Hamar to separate the women and children from the Miami villages and take them uh, hostage as a way to sort of force uh, the Miami to concede. Um, so I think, uh, those things are really important. I also think some of those powerful moments of the book are when um, they're, they're raising local militias to exterminate who's, who are, are intending to exterminate uh, the Creeks and the Seminole uh, as they're sort of going to war. I mean, those are really powerful moments when you realize that there's a buy-in on, on the national level and you don't, um, you see that there's a complicity. Um, uh, I think that's important. Um, so yeah, and then in terms of uh, other things, the other things in terms of thinking about the linking of these two things, even in uh, northern free states that are being created through the Northwest Ordinance, like Michigan, Wisconsin, all have to have uh, fugitive slave clause in their state constitutions uh, in order to, so that even though you're creating free, free states, you're still buttressing white property ownership in, uh, of slaves in the South. And then most of those states also have black laws uh, that are designed to prevent free blacks from immigrating by forcing them to pay uh, um, put down huge deposits, proving that their certificate of freedom, um, put down as much as $500 deposit at the county clerk's um, uh, office in order to uh, live there. They're prevented from going to school. So these, these moves where anti-Black racism and American expansion and dispossession are all completely intertangled, uh, are, it's really important to recognize these as all uh, of, of a common system, all of a piece. I just want to jump in there and say something about the complicity of, um, of white Americans. And um, it is one of, there are lots of awful um, chapters in this story. Um, but as you say, one of the most, and one of the most memorable and, and really terrible parts of it is when you, there were starving um, Creek refugees who were, were trying to find some sanctuary. So these are folks who lived, lived in present day Alabama. Um, and they were trying to find some sanctuary, some relief by fleeing through South Georgia to escape to the Seminoles in, in Florida. And um, local Georgia militia um, tracked them down and they're just horrendous stories of them chasing these families and following um, trails of blood and then shooting them down when, when they found them. And, and they made no bones about it. They said they were out to, um, to exterminate these people. So, um, so there was a lot of blame to go around in this policy. Um, 
in the north, there was a, a, um, a really organized campaign against in removal. And white Southerners said, well, this is just hypocrisy because you in the north, you, know, you exterminated native peoples 100, 200 years ago, and now you turn to us and you're so self-righteous about it, um, you know, telling us what to do. But um, I think William Apis put it best. He was a, um, a Pequot uh, Indian and a Methodist minister um, from Massachusetts. And, and he said, um, he said, yes, it's true that, that white Northerners um, are not living up to their ideals, but, but we should hold our friends fast and we should encourage them to do better. Um, and that's, that's the way he understood the political situation in the 1830s, rather than condemn them, hold them fast. Okay, um, we've got lots of wonderful questions here in the Q&A and also some hands raised. I'm gonna go to um, a hand raised here. The first one that I saw up, if you wanna unmute yourself, Carla Strand. Um, yeah, go ahead. You'll need to unmute though. Okay, you're still muted. Perhaps somebody can undo that. There we okay. go. Am I, am I? Yep, can hear you now. Hear you Terrific. Now. Go right ahead. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you for this. It's really um, fascinating. I have what well, would be a narrow question. I'm not sure um, if you've looked into this or not, but we know that white women played really active roles in uh, indigenous genocide with child removal and to boarding schools and foster homes. And I wonder if you know of white women's active participation in the mass deportations and the, the geographical location that, um, that, you were, that you were talking about in the book. Yes, I think um, you were dropping in and out, cutting in and out, but I think I got the gist of the question, which was about the role of white women in, in this um, larger story. Um, in, in fact, it, this, um, debate over deportation and expulsion um, led to the mobilization of white women in the North. Um, and, and in fact, it led to the first mass petition campaign organized by, by women in the North. So you can see these signatures, um, hund many hundreds of signatures on these petitions um, that are now in the National Archives. Um, this is especially interesting because women were not seen to have a, a political, a role in the political sphere in the 1830s. So it's really astonishing um, to, to see them kind of mobilizing at, at this time. Um, and, and equally, I think, surprising is to see that there were petitions that were signed um, by both men and women, and that was really unprecedented in the 1830s. There's been some interesting work um, by Ty Miles, uh, a professor at Harvard has, has written a fascinating article about this. And she's, she has suggested that they were inspired actually by, um, by the political activism of, of Cherokee women specifically. So it's, yeah, it's a really interesting subject. Great, um, thank you. There's a, uh, do, Kathleen or Michael, did you wanna weigh in on that at all? If you do, just jump right in. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna go to another um, hand raised here because you've been very patient, Jill Norgren. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can, go right ahead. Okay, so um, I think that Claudio addressed my first question about John Ross. Um, I was interested in hearing more from him about the role of Wall Street and foreign financial um, investors uh, in what happened in the Southwest. Yeah, so, um, so Wall Street, in the book, I, I follow the story of one particular character, um, this man named J.D. Beers, who was actually one of the leading financiers on Wall Street. And he 
was already involved in financing cotton as many Northern financiers were at the time. And as soon as the Indian removal bill uh, passed, he recognized that this was an extraordinary, really once in a century, as he and his friends often put it, opportunity to make money um, at the expense of, of native peoples. And so um, he and his, and his peers, all of the leading bankers, this is true in Boston and Philadelphia too, they immediately formed these joint stock companies. So they pulled their capital and then they sent agents down to Alabama and Mississippi and they flooded the region with capital they wanted to buy up Indian lands. And, and I don't wanna go into too much detail here, but the terms of their treaties for the Creeks and, and Choctaws, by the terms of their treaties, they could remain, they could take a plot of land in the South and they could hold it in fee simple. That is in the same way that people hold land today when they own it. Um, and they could remain in those states as citizens. Um, but these financiers saw that here was an opportunity. They could, they could coerce these people. They could trick them um, to sell their land on the cheap. Again, this is some of the most valuable agricultural land in the entire world at the time. So um, these joint stock companies, one of them is capitalized with a million dollars. That's a huge sum in the 1830s. And um, and some of the means that they use to purchase the land, um, I mean, they, 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 will, they will buy the land with paper money that's virtually worthless because virtually anybody could print money in the 1830s. They um, would send imposters to go before a judge to sign a contract, basically selling someone some other Choctaw's land. Um, when those things failed, they would, um, threaten people at gunpoint. There are stories of them, uh, of them holding people captive, um, beating them, torturing them to, to get their land. Um, so yeah, you can just follow the money straight to Wall Street. And, and as I said, there are investors in England too. Um, William Wordsworth's daughter ends up with some state bonds um, she had inherited from her aunt. These were state bonds that were issued to transform Indian lands, to convert Indian lands into slave plantations. So yeah, you can follow the capital all the way to Europe. That's a great opportunity to bring um, a question for all of you in here, I think, but I'm also going to just take a moment to remind everyone um, that indeed this is being recorded and indeed you can find um, the wonderful Washington History Seminar Series um, on the on the site and it's in the chat way at the top there. Um, so yes, you can go back and listen to that. And I think um, as Professor Duval mentioned, um, we can certainly um, create a kind of resource list of some of the scholarship that's been mentioned here and we'll find a way to get that um, out and available to folks. Um, so a question for the three of you um, is about the history of capitalism and settler colonialism. So the history of capitalism is a kind of, um, has been a bit of a growth industry um, in the scholarship and the history of settler colonialism and even the, the framing of settler colonialism is also relatively fresh. Some of the themes are longstanding um, but these, you know, thinking about history of capitalism and history of settler colonialism, slightly newish framing. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what advantages there are or might be to bringing those, um, those approaches together. And particularly for folks who may not be particularly familiar with either of those two developments in the scholarship, what do those bring to the subject that we're talking about here, native dispossession? Thank you. Um, Michael and Kathleen, do you want to jump in? Uh, I can jump in quickly. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting contrast from nowhere. Settler colonialism is an idea that that um, is, is an idea of colonialism that re requires replacing or eliminating the native, and replacing the native with the settler population. So that the goal of settler colonialism is elimination of the native, as opposed to, uh, say, think of colonial. Uh, Great Britain and India, where you're going to go, sort of have uh, people in India work for you. So it's it's a, a different mechanism, uh, and you can see this in action throughout the Southeast as um, Native people are in fact eliminated 
um, through treaty, through removal, force removal. But ironically, in, in Northern territories like Michigan, Wisconsin, it, the US doesn't really function as a settler colonial power so much as it functions as a colonial power because they, uh, there, there is, Claudio mentioned uh, the problem with paper money, uh, treaty annuities are paid in specie. And so, as I mentioned before, one of the things that's happening in Michigan and Wisconsin is that every time there's a treaty annuity payment, that's a lot of specie coming into Michigan or Wisconsin territory, uh, approximately 90, 95% of it is claimed by various non-native peoples as you know recovery of debt. And so you get a lot of money being made and you have people with an invested interest in keeping these uh, uh, colonial subjects. And so native peoples are uh, non-citizen subjects of a sort of colonial project of the United States to take over Michigan and turn it from Anishinaabewake into Michigan territory in the Michigan state. And so the money to be made there ironically isn't through um, the economy is with the cotton south, but actually the money that's being made, a lot of the infrastructure that's coming into places like Michigan is coming because you've got an ongoing relationship with the subjugated native population who are a source of income that can be sort of utilized. Um, it's not just the annuity payments are being grabbed, but then the, the same uh, uh, annuity payments include uh, a, a usually a large portion of goods and goods and provisions, trade goods and food supplies. And the people who are selling the trade goods and food supplies that the government is giving to natives as part of their annuity are the same people on the ground who are claiming parts of the cash annuity. So there's money to be made at all different levels. And it's a kind of a political economy of plunder um, that is just basically not just taking uh, native people, but just really stripping wealth from them in any form that there is. So um, I think you see these things as deeply implicated. Uh, I think it's, um, it's an interesting variation of America is often a settler colonial power, but sometimes it's actually a colonial power. Uh, and I think thinking about colonialism and settler colonialism, it's best to think of it as a kind of continuum. Um, and where colonialism works, America deploys that. Where it doesn't work, it uses settler colonialism. Oh, I think that's such a great point. And I, it's very clear that how the work of, of Claudio and Michael, uh, they're both really bringing together these two literatures in really fruitful ways. Um, I will say one of the dangers, I think, with both settler colonialism historiography and history of capitalism historiography is, sorry if there's some giggling in the background, um, he's not there's laughing about the subject, the rock, the um, the is that they can, um, they can take away our focus from people without power. Um, it is, they rightly focus on the ways that power is used against people. Um, but I think uh, the work of, of lots of people, including on this panel, are, are, are working against that at the same time and, and saying that we also can't understand these histories of you know, by only studying them top down. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add um, about settler colonialism. I think it has all of the problems that both of you mentioned. Uh, you know, the one the one thing I, I find valuable valuable about it is that it, it encourages us to think comparatively and, and to look at other um, colonies around the world. It's unfortunately it has been largely kind of Anglo oriented. Um, so I don't use the term myself, but but I do think it has some limited value. And in terms of the history of capitalism. Um, you know, there's just this question of following money and looking at finance. Um, it's, it, there's, there's so much still to be learned. And when I stumbled across um, these Wall Street bankers, I started just um, pulling on the thread. But, um, you know, at some point I, I had to stop because I was, I needed to continue telling the story of, of, of indigenous peoples and deportation. But, but there's a lot more to be said and we need to follow that thread across the Atlantic as well. I would also add it because I saw there, uh, there was at least one question about the term genocide that it, it has, I think, some of exactly the same benefits and dangers. Like I think genocide is very useful for thinking about what happened in the United and happens in the United States um, because of course genocide can be attempted, right? It doesn't have to succeed. And I think um, things like uh, Jeffrey Osler's surviving genocide just beautifully gets at both the awful um, and the survival, right? Um, and, and I think it genocide, think about genocide studies, it can help us think comparatively in really fruitful ways. Um, but then we also can get too wrapped up in those debates and, uh, and forget why we're here in the first place. And I think Claudio doesn't do that, right? He, he gets right back to the, to the history of, of the people in this time and place. <laughs>
Great. I was going to go to one other hand up, but now the person has either pulled their hand down or left. I don't know which. Sorry. <laughs> um, let me get. Let's go to a question um, about uh, kind of counterfactual, um, which is to say, oh, Paul Conrad, there you go. Your hand is back up. Good, good. Okay, Paul Conrad, we're going to you. Excellent. I, I can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, uh, I lowered my hand because Kathleen Duval just in some ways addressed my question. Um, I, I think I was just interested in pressing a little further. You know, I, I think one of the exciting things about history is this debate about the past. And, um, you know, I've, there's a number of really exciting recent books on um, the quote unquote Indian removal period, um, in, including Dr. Sant's and, and, and so, I was just interested in hearing more from more from him about um, the difference between this emphasis on uh, expulsion and contingency and um, others emphasis on genocide and continuity. Um, but, um, you know, Kathleen kind of already prompted it, but I, I'd love to hear just just a little more about it, about that from from Dr. Sant. Uh, yeah, and genocide. Um, I find it um, I, I find it a really valuable term to help us again think comparatively, to encourage us to think comparatively, not about um, which crime was worse. You know that to me doesn't seem to be a very fruitful to debate to have, um, but to to think about the historical connections between these deportations or genocides later in the 19th century in Southwest, German Southwest Africa, or later in, in World War II, and to think about the, that historical connection with um, the deportation of indigenous Americans. And you know, I, hint, I hint at that at the book, but I think there's more to be said. It, it really is interesting to me that um, in, um, in Poland in the 1920s, they're talking about the, you know, the so-called Madagascar plan and later Germans and Hitler pick up on this, this, this really preposterous project to colonize Jews in Madagascar. And, and they have all, they're using a lot of the same language that white Americans were using in the 1830s, that this is going to benefit everybody. Everybody's going to be a winner in this deportation. Jews are going to become farmers out in Madagascar and civilized, and they can't survive where they are. So this is really a humanitarian undertaking. Um, and um, and Roosevelt has an ad, uh, his advisor for refugees, Isaiah Bowman, who was the president of Johns Hopkins University at the time, um, was scouting locations around the world to colonize Jews. So it very much resembles um, this project in the 1830s. So that really interests me, kind of making those historical connections and tying the early 19th century into the late 19th and, and 20th centuries. Great, thank you. I wondered if we could um, head into a slightly counterfactual question here. This might be the last one we can handle. Um, but this is a question about what would have happened if the House had voted down the removal bill, um, or if Jackson had responded to the court by saying, you know, um, you know, something. In other words, um, in fact, was Jackson was his cynical argument that removal was for the Indians' own uh, protection? Was he right about that? It, would white Americans, particularly in Georgia and Alabama, have allowed their indigenous neighbors to live there in peace? Um, certainly not in peace, uh, but, but Jackson gave a green light and as soon as he stepped into office and his first address to the nation, he said, we're, we're going to, we're going to move these people. And of course he said, oh, this is for their own good, but he said, we're going to move them. And white Southerners knew who he was. He was a planter. He was involved in land speculation. He had a history of making war against indigenous Americans. They knew exactly who he was, um, which is why he won 99% of the vote. Of course, these are only white men, but he won 99% of the vote in Georgia. So, um, I mean, they, they knew who they were getting. But um, in, in terms of some sort of counterfactual, 
I mean, I don't think it's too difficult or far-fetched to imagine a situation in which Native peoples continue to negotiate and delay the act perhaps would have failed for a variety of reasons, not because purely because of the benevolence of the people voting, but they have lots of contradictory interests at work. But let's say it failed. By the 1840s, they're fighting over abolition. Um, and by the 1850s, the sectional crisis is in full bloom. And then um, post-Civil War, you can imagine any kind of settlement that would have allowed Native peoples to retain their homelands. And I'm not um, naive enough to think that they could have retained every square foot of their land. I don't think that Indigenous politicians were that naive. And that's why they were proposing um, compromises within this very unjust political situation that they thought were plausible and might work. And in fact, right through 1837, um, John Ross is still negotiating and he's still holding out hope that the Cher Cherokees can retain his homelands. At one point, it appears that there's an offer on the table allowing the Cherokees to remain, but he says it's the plot of land is too small and it's unworkable for them. He held out, perhaps this was a mistake on his part, but he held out, he thought it would be possible to receive um, a larger share of their traditional homeland. So this is straight through 1837. And by that time, there were actually even Southern politicians who were, who were um, suggesting that it would be fine with their constituents if the Cherokees remained. There was a Senator from Tennessee who said that. Um, out loud. So, um, so certainly, I think um, there were other there were other paths that we could have followed. Thank you so much, Claudio. I'm just going to make a few concluding remarks here, and then hand it back to Eric to wrap us and send us off. The first thing I want to do is just thank all of you so much um, for this wonderful conversation um, and for such a wonderful um, kind of. Um, uh, first outing for the Omohundro Partnership with the Washington History Seminar. Um, I'm just going to shout out here two of the next Omohundro co-sponsored events on March 1st for Brandon Bird's book, The Black Republic, African Americans and the Fate of Haiti. And then in April 19th, Kate Mazur's book, Until Justice Be Done, Af uh, America's First Civil Rights Movement from the Revolution to the Civil War. And of course, the wonderfully rich schedule of the Washington History Seminar in between just absolutely chock full. Um, so thank you so much, Claudio, Michael, and Kathleen, and everyone who asked such fantastic questions, which we could only begin to um, start to address. We will figure out a way to get some um, resources and um, stuff back out to you all. So back to you, Eric. Thanks, Thanks so much. Actually, I, let me do that. Let me do the concluding remark. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Before adjourning this meeting, let me remind uh, our viewers that we have two upcoming sessions. This Friday, January 29th, we'll host Joan Scott for a discussion of her book on the judgment of history. And next Monday, February 1st, we'll have a panel on Sarah Miller Davenport's new book, Gateway State, Hawaii and the Cultural Transformation of the American Empire. Again, thanks to Karen, Claudia, Kathleen, Michael and Eric for this terrific discussion this afternoon. Thanks for the Mahandra Institute for co-sponsorship. We're excited about continuing that uh, with some forthcoming sessions. Thanks to all of you out there for watching, for participating, for your questions. We're adjourned, stay well and be safe. Take care. Thanks everyone.